organizations to reach their potential. With a background in business development, he also has a creative eye as an artist, and he, and he brings a unique perspective to the world of learning and development. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, with your permission, I want to welcome our two distinguished guests. And I'll first hand over the mic to Benny, as I like to call him, to start the conversation with us. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Alfred. Please confirm if you could hear me very well. Yes. Oh, you. Allowed. Oh, yes please. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. And thank you, Alfred, once again, and Gideon, for the opportunity to be part of this discussion. Um, today's session is a continuation of our last session, as mentioned by Gideon. And this is only coming to pass because of the request we received from several participants who participated in the last session. In our last session, we had the opportunity to discuss a few tips on how to prepare a CV and how to prepare for an interview. So just to give us a, a recap, um, especially for those that couldn't join us last week, we discussed the four types of CVs, that's the chronological functional combination and then the targeted CVs. We spoke about how and when to use them. Um, the second part of the discussion was also focused on interview preparation, where we looked at the various ways to predict interview questions that's um, using the job descriptions and person specifications from the job advert. If you need to refresh yourself any of these discussions, uh, I believe the video recording to last, last two weeks session has been published on YouTube and shared with all. So just get a link to assess it. And, or possibly the admin, I think it will be good to share the link at the comment session for easy access. Today's discussion will be focused on ATS. Uh, that is the applicant tracking system. We will look at what it is, how it works, and how best to optimize our CVs to be able to pass the ATS selection phase. Also, there's a second section to today's discussion, and that will be focused on the best ways to answer some of the commonly asked job interview questions you are likely to meet in any job interview you attend. What this means is, um, just like we say in school, you have an appall, how you handle will determine how well you perform or how well you respond to those questions. We will discuss exactly what the panel expects when they ask these questions, and possibly if there is time, we discuss a few possible responses to some of the questions. So to begin with, let's first look at what an ATS is. ATS is actually a software used by most companies and specifically recruiters to screen the suitability of candidates for a role using their CVs or let me say resumes and also to track progress through the hiring process. So basically the hiring process is in stages, the screening, the interviewing, they all form part of the selection process and then the other processes. So what the ATS does is possibly to first of all screen and also assist in, the, in tracking the progress during the process, the hiring process. Considering the number of applicants we received and the time consuming nature in screening CVs of um, these applicants. And I'm telling you, we receive over thousands of applicants for job adverts. It has therefore become necessary for companies to employ the use of technology in the screening processes. And mostly this is done at the pre-screening stage. How do we then use the system to be able to do the screening? Because if I upload my CV, how would the system know that this CV meets the requirements of the rule or will be a best fit for the rule. And for that reason, it's supposed to select this particular CV and reject the others. Understanding how the system is able to do this screening, what it looks out for, gives you the opportunity to tailor your CV in that regard. So you are not left out of the screening process. So basically it does this, um, firstly, a job requisition is saved on the ATS. And this requisition includes your, the required competencies or information about the position, such as um, the job title, the desired skills and required experiences. The ATS then uses this information to create a profile for the ideal candidate. It looks at the specifications that have been provided in terms of the competencies required for the rule. And based on that, it forms an ideal candidate that will fit or suit this particular rule. So as applicants submit their CVs, the ATS passes, sorts, and then ranks these CVs based on how well they match the profile of the ideal candidates, which has been created by the ATS. 
So it's looking at your CV and then it's looking at the candidate that it's looking out for, matching the CV to see if they match or they meet what he is looking out for or what the system is looking out for. The system then sends this to the hiring manager, or let me say the hiring team. And the hiring team quickly identifies the most qualified candidates and move them forward in the hiring process. And this could be either further screening to reduce the number based on the most qualified for the role, or just use what they have received from the system to arrange for interviews. What's especially important to understand is that um, recruiters often filter CVs by searching for key skills and job titles. And in my last submission, our previous session, I kept talking about matching the job description and the person's specifications to your, your skills to ensure that you meet what they are looking out for. It's the same way the system also matches these skills and job titles to, 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 to get the ideal candidate. So for example, if a recruiter is hiring, let's say an administrative assistant for an administrative assistant position, and there are, let's say a thousand CVs, the first step will probably be um, the ATS system searching for key terms such as an administrative assistant. This helps to isolate candidates that have done the exact job from the rest. So if the, if the ATM is able to identify those that have administrative assistance on their CV and then group them at one place before it does the other screenings. Anyone that doesn't have the exact term in their CV is out of luck and might actually lose the opportunity to be selected. Other times too, we do a combination of multiple terms. Um, so for this same example, that is administrative assistant example, the system can perform a complex search that contains a combination of job titles and skills, um, such as administrative assistance, um, administration. So administrative assistance is the road title. Administration could be the section or the operations. Uh, we could really talk about data entry because it forms part of the accountability. So let me see the task that the person will be performing. So the skill is also, I mean, added as a term. So data entry, we can look at document management and even payroll, et cetera. There are so many that we can look at. But these are all multiple terms that the systems combines to be able to identify the exact perfect candidates for the rule. So this means that if you can predict the CV keywords that recruiters and for that matter, the system will use in their search, you will greatly increase your chances of moving on into the, in the next hiring process. And to be able to identify which keywords to use in your CV to pass the ATS screen or um, face, all you have to do is to analyze the job description to find them. This is similar to what we discussed in our last session. First of all, ensure, if possible and where relevant, the role title of a keyword or term in the job title appears in your CV. That is to say, if you are looking for an administrative assistant, if it is possible, if you perform a role that is similar to it, ensure that this particular keyword, the administrative, the administration, the assistant, the clerk, whatever it is, appears on your CV. This, if done um, rightly, actually increases your chance of the system picking up your CV. Secondly, you can also look at the screen, the job description to identify the key elements within the required experience and ensure these key elements appear in your CV. So if you remember, um, last, in our last session, when we were, we were administrative assistants, we did mention that um, the person will be handling multiple, I mean, calls. And for that reason, if you are drafting your CV, you must ensure that this appears in your CV if it is something that you've performed before, because it is important. The ATS system is going to check if these are the key elements, then it's going to check if you have either performed or perf performed the exact task or performed a similar task to this um, particular accountability. Moving on to the second part of today's discussion. I want us to spend some time to discuss what interviews, interviewers look out for when they are asking, or when they ask um, commonly interview questions. And for this, for, for the purpose of today, I'll just spend time to talk about, just say four of them, four of them. That is introduce yourself to the panel. Um, what are your strengths? Why have you decided to apply for this job? And where do you see yourself in the next five years? These are commonly interview questions. And I can tell you between a range of zero to 100%, you have about 99% to meet this in at least one of your interviews. So to the first question, 
introduce yourself to the panel. Why do interviewers ask this question? In any case, I mean, they have your CV and should be able to see and know what you, you, they need from your CV. Remember last week, um, I mentioned your CV is the only opportunity for employers to get to know you and see what you're capable of. And they use the interview to confirm what you have on your CV. So introduce yourself to the panel or in a different way, it can be asked as tell me about yourself. Seems to always appear or it's a common introductory question that many interviewers use to break the ice. In a way, to kind of relax you and take you out of the tension in the room before they get into the critical questions or the technical questions that they need to make a decision on the right candidate. This might seem like an easy win for an interview question. After all, you know all about yourself. Uh, but in truth, it can, it, it can actually feel stressful and complicated as you don't really know what exactly they want to hear from you. As with any interview question, the key to crafting an impressive answer is understanding why people are asking that question in the first place. This question actually is designed to get you talking about something you know, thus you in relation to the job and not just to yourself. So it's not like when we're in the JHS or the primary school when they ask you to write yourself and then you start talking about your parents and the food you like and all that, no. A big mistake usually made by the majority of people is that they focus on their family, their children, their hobby, their hobbies, and even home life. Um, whilst you may have some interesting facts about your personal life, you should either avoid these unless specifically asked or keep them very brief. If you're not asked to talk about your family, please just be silent on that. If you're not asked to talk about your hobbies, be silent. If you want to talk about your hobbies, you remember I spoke about how to draft or tailor your hobbies in your favor when we spoke about putting the hobbies on the CV in our last session. In the same way, if you're going to speak about your hobbies, you ensure that this is related to the rule and it forms part of your personal attributes. And for that matter, strengths that you can talk about. And responding to the question of introduce yourself to the panel, always try to tailor your responses around your own personal experiences and achievements your educational background and ongoing studies, as well your personal attributes as they relate to the rural and company. And in order to do that, you must um, review the job description, research the company, and pick out specific elements from that description that you can use in your interview response, a way that makes crystal clear why you are interested in the rural and what you bring onto the table that aligns with the rural and company. I would want to share probably one or two examples just to give you an idea of how to draft such a response. And considering most of the participants here are either still in school or recent graduates, I would want to give an example of a good response that can be provided by um, a recent graduate, that someone with the limited experience. And this response will be for someone applying for a junior web development um, web, web developer role. A good response to this question um, would be something like, thank you for the opportunity. I'm a graduate from the University of Ghana with a Bachelor of Science degree with a major in computer science and a minor in theater arts. And I've been spending this summer interning at a theater nonprofit. I've had the chance to put my coding skills to good use by helping revamp the organization's ticket sales page. Since it launched two weeks ago, the time it takes patrons to get through the purchasing process has decreased by 43%, and scores on a pop-up satisfaction survey have gone up by nearly 20%. It's been particularly exciting to be immersed in this environment because I've been in love with the theater, with theater work since I did my first school play in JHS1. It was a play on um, Quaker Nancy, the wisest man on earth, and I landed the major role of Quaker Nancy. This internship experience has only reinforced my desire to merge my CS skills with my passion for theater, which is why I knew I had to apply as soon as I saw the junior web development role here. It is important that you realize that as much as possible, this candidate specifically focused his response on first his education, where he graduated from University of Ghana and his degree, which is Bachelor of Science degree with a major in computer science, a minor in theater arts. He then went on to speak about his experience in coding. Remember, he's applying for a junior web developer role. However, 
he's also applying into a theater, a, a theater industry where he's going to be focused on web development. He exhibited his success in coding by reducing, indicating that he has um, decreased um, the purchasing process by 43%. And also, based on the pop-up satisfaction survey that was conducted, it actually went up by nearly 20%. That is to say, there has been an increase, or let me say, a positive resource in his contribution in the coding skills, giving an indication to the company that if he's given the opportunity, he can put these skills and experiences to use to improve positively to the organization's, I mean, goal. He also went on to speak about his interest and his desire from a very child, I mean, from his childhood in theater act, where he played a role in theater, giving, reinforcing his desire to be in the industry and also his skills in the specific role that he's applying to fit. So, I mean, this is just an example for a recent graduate who does not have a lot of experience, but he was able to exhibit his internship experiences obtained through his internship, as well as his desire in theater act. I'll give another example, um, which will be for someone changing careers. And this will be for someone changing jobs from account management to HR, specifically training. The example can be, um, I've spent the first decade of my career working in account management for SaaS startups, selling B2B software, including my current company, which develops remote collaboration tools. And for the last couple of years, I've been managing three to five direct reports. I found people management incredibly fulfilling and have been especially drawn to training and professional development. One of the accomplishments I'm proudest of in my job now was creating a series of upscaling workshops, not just for my own team, but for the entire revenue organization, account managers and sales reps who participated and showed an average increase of 22% in sales or renewal revenue per quarter. Looking back, it makes so much sense that I've gravitated in this direction, considering I tutored and led workshops for the comms department in college. As I've thought about my next steps, I realized I wanted to transition into an HR role so that I can focus all of my energy on creating and implementing training programs. I can't think of a better place to start that than a company that makes software I've relied on in multiple previous jobs. This is straightforward. This is someone who is already working. It could be within the same organization. It could be you changing jobs from one company to the other. However, he, first of all, made mention of his current experiences, what he does, and the experiences that have drived the interest in making him make the decision to move into HR and specifically training. He shared his training experiences, which could be seen in where he said, considering I tutored and led workshops in the comms department in the college. And also he spoke about his training and development expertise, where he even helped in upskilling workshops, not just for his team, but also for the entire revenue department. So in changing your job, in as much as you do not have relevant experiences or probably enough experiences in the new role that you are moving into, it is important that you speak about what you do and what has led to you making the decision to actually move into this new field of interest. It is very important. Let's now look at the second common interview questions that you are likely to meet, uh, which is what are your strengths? This sounds like a very um, easy question to answer. However, it's surprisingly difficult for many people to talk about their strengths during an interview. It's challenging to balance um, humility with the need to project confidence. I've sat in interviews where um, a candidate has provided a response such as I'm a strong, and a macho person um, trying to depict a muscular or let's say depict a strong person by using the word macho. As, as this sounds, this sounds very casual actually. It sounds an um, unprofessional, even though it could be relatable to the person. And obviously look, looking at the person sitting in front of us is three times or probably four times my size in terms of muscles. And it is so relatable, however, it is irrelevant. It does not depict professionalism. It sounded so casual, and this is a good response. So the question is, what are the expectations from this interview panel when they ask you this question? Employers ask these questions um, to know if you know your own strengths, if you are realistic, and if your strengths are relevant to the job you are applied for. 
The underlying word here is relevance for the job you applied for. The easiest approach to answering this question is by following this formula. And this is not a stated formula anywhere. This is a formula that I personally use. And based on experience, I think a lot of people use and it goes well for them. In responding to the question of strength, you first have to state your strength. Ensure to use um, the job description as your guide as you select the strengths you wish to highlight. Then you provide, a, you provide a context and story of when and how you have used this particular strength. And when providing the context for your personal strengths, it is important you address the qualities that qualify you for the job and distinguishes you as a candidate. So I would advise that um, you give work-related examples. You should try to think of a three good strengths um, that you possess and provide an example of when you have used this or those strengths. Optionally, you can describe what kind of impact um, you made as a result of using this strength. So for example, um, I want to give an example that focuses on leadership. So a good response to this question could, could be, um, I've, always been in a, I've always been a natural leader. With more than 10 years of experience in finance and sales, I've exceeded my KPIs every quarter, and I've been promoted twice in the past five years. I look back at those successes and know that I wouldn't have reached them if I hadn't built and led teams composed of highly skilled and diverse individuals. I'm proud of my ability to get cross-functional groups on the same page. I've regularly honed my management skills through 360 reviews and candid sessions with my team. And I know continuing to build my leadership skills is something I want from my next role. Now, it is important that you exhibit how you've used these leadership skills. And in this response, you could see that the candidates continually spoke about the skill leading the team, his success, which is actually was made possible because of the kind of team he led. And obviously, a good leader can be determined by the kind of team that he has. So he exhibited, spoke about his team, spoke about the skills itself, and even the duration of experience with, uh, exhibiting this skill. Now, let's move on to the next question, which is why have you decided to apply for this job? This again is a very common interview question and one that needs to be answered carefully. Employers ask this question to make sure you have done your research and know what the role entails. Also, they want to see if you have thought about your own career and know what you are looking out for. So it's not just about now, but also your future ambitions. Remember that an interview panel will, will, will have heard of all of, of, of the usual responses such as um, I've wanted to work in this kind of role since I was a child. Um, I've heard others even who say they, they always look up to their parents and seeing my dad do this job, I've always wished I could one day fit into his shoes. Others will say this job um, just really appeals to me. These types of uh, standard responses will gain you few marks. I mean, obviously it wouldn't be an, a zero. You will gain some few marks, but you wouldn't get the total marks. It is crucial that you provide a response to this type of question that is unique and truthful and even different from all of the other candidates. And you can make it unique by relating it to yourself, making sure that it's something that you really possess. In responding to the question, it is important to explain certain specifics that you are looking for in your job search. This can be an opportunity for an advancement, um, a chance to continue building your skills in a certain area, a chance to get involved in a new area or any number of other things that you can think of. You need to make sure whatever you say fits their job and company. And it's very important. The company culture and then the job requirements should always be your target. You do not say things that are, are, are not related to the, the role that you're applying for and also the company that you are, you are moving into. It is very important to take note of that. You can name the industry you want to be working in the type of rule, the size or type of company that you're looking out for. There are so many things you can talk about here, but you need to have something to demonstrate you have thought about what you want to be doing in your next job. Secondly, tell them something you noticed about their job that um, you liked so much or aroused your interest in them. Talk about what caught your interest. You could mention details you saw on the job descriptions, on the company websites, etc. I mean, Show them you understand what their role involves and are excited to be doing that work. Something that will make them know that you are really into this and you really want to do this. 
And finally, recap what you have said to show exactly how their job fits what you are looking for. You have told them what you are looking for. You have told them why their, their job seems interesting to you. So now you just need to conclude by saying something like this. Um, so that's why I applied for this job. It seems like an opportunity to build the specific skills I want to be learning in my career while working in the industry I'm, I'm most interested in. Um, for this final step, you can also consider adding a bit about how your previous experiences will help you do well in your job. So using the example I provided earlier, you could add a sentence to the end and say, so just let me take that one again. So that's why I applied for this job. It seems like an opportunity to build the specific skills I want to be learning in my career while working in the industry I'm most interested in. Also, since I've been doing this exact type of work for the past two years in my current job, in the same industry, I will also hit the ground running and start contributing immediately to your team's effort. This conclusion or this ending part that we added to the earlier submission is actually a reaffirmation of the fact that if they should select you today, they wouldn't need to train you. You are only coming to hit the ground running. You would come and there will be no break in, in, in the delivery of the task. And it's very important. Most organizations or most recruiters, when they are recruiting, they're obviously looking for someone that will come and with little efforts will start executing the task with no support. Um, the last question to discuss um, is where do you see yourself in the next five years? This is tricky, actually. Um, it's also an extremely common question among interview panels. And this question can also be asked in different ways, such as um, what are your long-term career objectives? It's actually the same. Be careful how you answer this one. Um, I've been on interview panels where people say, truthfully, I don't know. I'll see what happens as the year goes. This is not a very good response to this question and displays a lack of ambition and drive. I've also been on interview panels where people have given responses such as, I would like to be in your seat doing your job. Whilst uh, I don't disbelieve them, obviously, I mean, who wouldn't want to? I feel that this type of response displays arrogance rather than confidence. Try to structure your answer in a way that shows you are positive about the future, but not overconfident. Before we talk extensively on how to answer this question, um, let's look at why interviewers never fail to ask this particular question. Whatever, whether in different manners or whatever it is, they always make sure they ask this question. Why is it important to interviewers? Interviewers will normally ask these questions um, to measure the candidate's motivation and future goals, and also to gauge how well they match up with the role they are interviewing for. They want to understand what value you will bring to the organization on your way to achieving your goals. It is important because if I know where you intend to go in the next five years, I will then be able to know if you, you would be with me for a longer period, or probably are just coming to be with me as probably a stepping stone and then move to another place. It gives a lot of information. Your response provides a lot of information to the interview, interviewing panel. And for that reason, you have to be very cautious on the response that you give to them. And finally, they also want to know what kind of person you are and what you intend to become. The best way to respond to this question is to first realize that it has no definite answer and obviously no one knows where he or she will be in the next five years likewise um, the interview panel themselves as such they do not expect you to know where it is therefore there is no formula um, that should be followed as far as this question is concerned instead what your interviewer is looking forward to here is your career hopes and aspirations and how they can fit into the company it is therefore important that you remain simple and be down to earth. However, you can use this strategy as a guide, um, a strategy I've been using in almost all interviews I've attended. You will start your answer with one or two key goals and consider connecting them with some of the qualities you want to convey to the interviewer. For example, um, I am someone who loves learning about new technology and trends. So in the next five years, I see myself as having established strong knowledge on what's new and emerging in digital marketing. So um, I'm demonstrating my ability to learn new things, and especially in technology and, tre and trends. And because the area I'm looking up for is probably digital marketing, I'm trying to ensure that the 
specific goal that I'm putting forward, I'm putting forth, is one that relates to the role that I'm applying for and also the industry I'm entering. Next, you need to dive into how and why you have done these things. Interviewers would want to see that you have thought thorough or through your plan. So continuing with the example I provided, I might say by working as an analyst, I would have gained experience in analyzing the results of a range of marketing tactics. And I would have stayed on top of new development by becoming active in one or more professional marketing groups. I will have also used my analysis and knowledge to contribute to the conception of marketing campaigns and gain some experience running campaigns myself. This will give me a good foundation in marketing practice and help me leverage new trends effectively to create marketing campaigns that never feel still. You realize that as I speak about the skill itself or the books, I, I, I ensure that I indicate specifically how it's going to benefit the organization and even the role that I'm going to sit in. I speak about gaining experience in analyzing results of a range marketing tactics as a result of me learning new technologies and trends. And I would have stayed on top of new development by becoming active in one or more professional marketing groups. This is how I'm going to do it. This is how, this is how I've planned to be able to gain this experience by staying on top of new development, by becoming active in one or more professional marketing groups. It is important to let them feel realistically how you, you are going to achieve this. Once they know that you have a goal and you have a way to work it out to achieve what you've intended to achieve in the next five years, they gain trust and believe in what you are saying. Also, you can choose to even complete your response, demonstrating an ambition beyond the next five years. And it's important. Um, I would actually advise that you do that because if you are able to demonstrate an ambition beyond the next five years, which is, in, which is relatable to the role and organization, it gives every recruiter or employer the confidence in you. So if I'm to craft a statement um, added to what I've provided earlier, I would say from there, I'm hoping to decide if I would like to become a marketing specialist or continue as a journalist. But regardless, I'm hoping to eventually move into a marketing manager or strategist position where I'm making bigger picture choices regarding campaigns and branding. And this is actually something that every organization would want because if I'm picking an analyst, I would want to see that there is a growth plan for this analyst who can at the long run become even small heads organization. So that it means in terms of succession, we have someone that we can look out for. So in summary, when responding to this question of where you see yourself in the next five years, it is important to start your answer with one or two key goals, and then you dive into how and why you would have done these things. And then finally finish with your ambitions beyond the next five years. Um, I see is 7.45, so um, I'll end here and I'll hand over to the facilitator and wish to respond to your questions if there is any at the end of the entire session. So, um, Wilfred, I think this will bring me to the end of today's session. Thank you very much, uh, Benny. And that that has been a thorough 40, 30 minutes. Yes, 30 minutes of um, interesting conversation on the A to Z of interview. So quickly, uh, Benny spoke about introducing yourself and also um, the question that normally comes on you demonstrating your strength and then why you have applied for the role and then where you see yourself in the next five years. That's uh, a very interesting narrative. And, and I remember you mentioned that the introduction is, is your first opportunity to make a good impression. So we need to make sure that we are well prepared and professional about, about the introduction. So what it means is that if, if your introduction is powerful, then the panel gets interested in, in your personality as a candidate. And then they look forward to seeing more of you. But where you give a very weak introduction, then everybody uh, loses enthusiasm and they are even likely to uh, run you through the section quickly for you to leave them. Anyway, um, if you have questions for Benny, 
kindly type, type them out in the chat area. We'll, we'll come back to the questions later. But at this point, we want to hand over to Seth to also take us through um, what he has for us this evening. So Seth. Thank you very much, Wilfred. So hi, guys. I am Seth. Um, am I being heard loud and clear? Yes, we can hear you. Right. Okay, great. So we've had an exciting first um, part with Benny, highlighting how to, or what kind of answers to give to some of the critical questions. So thanks so much. I'm excited to be here right now. And um, it's one thing to know the right answers to give, and it's a whole different thing to know how to articulate this. So in this session, I'm going to talk about how to confidently answer these questions or how to overcome your fears when it comes to interviews. So I'll be talking about um, strategies for overcoming interview anxiety, preparing for the interviews and improving your communication skills and body language during interviews. So at the end of this talk, um, you have a better understanding of how to approach interviews with confidence and ease. So the big notice has come to you. You've applied for a role and now you've had a notification that, hey, you've been shortlisted and you have been arranged for an interview. At that moment, it is a mixture of excitement because, hey, you now have the shot, but then it could be mixed with fears, right? That wait, am I going to perform that right? Am I going to be picked? You are one step closer to landing that job you've been dreaming of. So it is, it is reasonable to be anxious a bit, but let's take a look at how to fight this anxiety and go through the interview in such a smooth and stress-free way. One thing is to understand interview anxiety, okay? This is a common experience for many individuals. Because so anything if, be, it will be used against you. You can't say you are going to take their positions. You can't yeah. tell them. Uh, Emmanuel. Hello. What. Emmanuel Akuri. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Emmanuel. All right, so I have muted every, everyone. Um, I'm on muting um, Seth. So Seth, please give me a few seconds. Right, Seth, you can unmute yourself. Okay, please. All right, cool. So, all right, I can be heard now. So one thing is to understand anxiety, um, interview anxiety. So this is, this is a common experience, okay? I was talking earlier, before this interview with my daughter. And she tells me that she's been having lots of anxieties when she's approaching her exams. And so I was telling her, hey, she's not the only one, even adults face this. And just like when we used to have such um, anxieties during our exams, it is still natural to have these things when it comes to um, interviews. And this is the feeling of nervousness or apprehension that you get when you're about to be interviewed. Because interviews are like exams, right? You're going to be questioned about what you know. And so it's kind of related. Some of the symptoms of interview anxiety include sweating, um, increased heart rate, trembling, um, shortness of breath, difficulty concentrating. My daughter was saying that she gets hot when the time is coming, like physically hot. So these are all symptoms of such anxieties. Um, and there are several reasons why people experience anxiety during interviews. This could be due to the pressure of the situation, the fear of being judged or the uncertainty of what to expect. What questions are going to be thrown at me? Um, am I going to fail? Are they going to see me as less um, ideal for the role? All these thoughts could be the reason why you would be going through these um, interviews, sorry, these um, anxieties. However, preparing right is the key. So let's take a look at some preparation techniques that will help um, you to ease down 
if you are feeling anxious. So one of the best ways to reduce interview anxiety is to prepare well. First, you need to start by researching the company and the role you are applying for. You need to know stuff about the company because you're going to be asked. I've sat in countless interviews and this question is a sure one. Tell us about our company. So you don't want to research so much the history where um, they're aimed at, the company's vision, culture, and values. You've got to research these things. Once you know these things well, there's a twofold benefit to this. One is that it puts you at ease because you know the answers to the questions going to be asked. Secondly, if you know the cultures and values of this company you are interviewing for, it helps you to tailor your answers in a way that best suits them. You are not going to be lying. However, you would, you would frame your answers in a way that they would find appealing. For example, if you're dealing with a company that is big on green stuff, they want to, they are energy saving companies, you'd want to tailor your answers or your focus toward that, which makes you endearing to them because they can tell that you are aligned with them, right? Um, again, you need to know very much about the job requirements and the responsibilities. This is in the JD. So wherever it is that you saw the job advert, it is going to be listed. The qualities needed for these things. You need to read and understand them very well. Okay. Once you get a clear mindset of the company you are going to be working with and the job requirements, it helps you to answer in a more relaxed and confident way. Okay, next, you need to prepare responses to common interview questions. And much of it, I shouldn't go even deeper into that. Benny has done justice to um, those parts. But I should repeat, you need to prepare responses to these things. Because once you know the answers, you are going to be automatically um, confident. Imagine you talking about a topic that you are so versed in. See the, the passion and the energy you use in, in answering. That is the kind of energy you want to nurture. And it can only come if you are well-versed in what you are about to say, okay? You also need to practice your interviews with friends and family, okay? So this is the period where you can use your buddies very well. You get them to listen to you. They can um, set up mock um, interviews with some of the expected questions. Let them ask you, let them ask you in a timed fashion and then you deliver. This, you can go over it multiple times. And guess what? They can give you direct feedback during that period. So they can tell you, um, you really didn't nail this one so right because you left these parts in, let's try it again. Or you were too tense, okay? You, you kind of was speak, you were speaking in a, in a high pitch way. Relax, sit back. All these things will help you to see all the issues you might be having. And once you iron these ones out, it is going to help you to now be relaxed because in your mind, you know you have gone through this thing and you have become better at it. So do use friends or family members to give you feedback on these things. The next point I want us to talk about is having the right mindset. Guys, your mindset plays a huge role in how you perform during interviews. Adopting a positive mindset can help you feel more confident and calm. And I mean confident, not cocky, okay? So I've started interviews. This guy is, is very qualified for the role. However, he kind of is overconfident. So he's sitting in a, in a very casual way. He's throwing his hands all about. His facial expression is like, come on, man, this job is so, so little for me and I can breeze through it. This made him not get the role. Because after the interview, folks were like, oh, come on, man. He's, he doesn't respect the role. Like he's, he's feeling he's high and above. So when I say that, you should have a mindset where you adopt a positive um, attitude. It means have positive attitude and that's it. Don't go overboard. Don't go overconfident and don't go cocky, okay? 
one thing in setting up the right mindset or ensuring that you have the right mindset is that you should visualize a successful interview, okay? The mind is a powerful tool. Imagine that the interview has gone on successfully. Picture yourself walking into the room, answering questions with ease and living with confidence. If it is an in-person in interview, sit back, close your eyes, imagine this, go through this imagination period. It helps you build your confidence. It helps reduce the anxiety. If it is a virtual interview, imagine yourself turning on the, the camera. Imagine yourself having a very professional smile, introducing yourself with confidence, going through the answers smoothly, and then exiting with, with confidence that you've nailed this interview. This imagination is critical, okay? Play it throughout your mind and you'd realize that your delivery is going to be as close as your imagination, okay? Now, same on the mindset. In as much as we would want to have a positive mindset or visualize a successful outcome, we must deliberately fight against negative self-talk. And this is the commonest, right? the self-doubting voice in your head that is telling you you are not so adequate for this job. Um, there might be others who are overqualified, who are beyond you for this job role. Shut that sound off. Instead of telling yourself that you are not good enough, focus on your strengths and accomplishments. Remind yourself that you've made it this far, okay? Guess what? A ton of guys applied for this role. Many were screened. Out of the screened, you are among the ones who have been shortlisted for this interview. Do you know how much success that is? If you speak to lots of HR folks, like Benny, um, Wilfred, Gideon, myself, the ton of applications that come and the percentage of people who are shortlisted for interview, it's, it's mind boggling. It's a huge gap and you have been um, invited for this interview. That itself is a win. It tells you that the panel sees you as an ideal candidate, a possible ideal candidate. So shut off that negative thought in your head that you, you might not be there. If you allow that thing to have voice, it's going to kill your confidence and your anxiety is going to go through the roof. So honestly, this is not imagining yourself as you are the king of the world or anything. It is addressing the fact that you have been interviewed, invited to the interview. And so that in itself is a successful thing, okay? Now, you need to pay attention to your body language. Your body language can communicate just as much as your words. Good body language can help you to appear confident and engaged and interested. I'm going to go back to the other interview examples I've had. There were guys who, who were sitting in a casual way. They've tilted themselves away from the screen, if it is virtual, or even if it is in person, they are sitting in a slouched, um, casual way. Yes, the point is that you need to be relaxed, but the point is not to be casual, okay? So you need to pay attention to even your body language. You might say all the right words. Your body language might do you harm. So pay attention to all these things. Every single detail about you should play in your advantage, okay? So in our body language, we start by maintaining eye contact with the interviewer. So this will help you appear attentive and interested. Having eye contact also gives the vibe of you being honest, that you're not looking around for answers and that you want to be forthright you need to maintain good posture. So you need to sit up straight, avoid slouching. There are folks who would put their elbows on the table. And this applies to still virtual guys as well as in-person inter interview sessions. If you put your elbow on the table and you slouch forward, it is still picked up from the, from the screen or from the camera. You'd want to sit up right and then sit straight. Don't turn your side to the camera or don't turn your sides to the interviewers. Sit straight because it's a formal setting. 
you might be qualified for the role, you might be seeing it as a breeze, but that particular period is a make or break event. You don't want to give chance to anything that would, that would mess you up. You need to be confident, but remember, don't be cocky, okay? Don't be putting one elbow and then um, putting your fist under your chin and taking it as though you're chatting with, with a peer. Avoid fidgeting too, okay? So that is where when nervousness comes in, you, you might panic. And then to conceal that fear, people end up fidgeting. So either they are playing with pens in the, between their fingers or they are twirling their hair if they are a girl or um, scratching their beard. Keep in mind, do not, okay? The more you keep in mind that you're not going to be doing these things, the more confident you appear and the more confident you'll be because you're appearing confident. I don't know if that makes sense to you guys. So remember that, have a good posture, do not fidget. Use hand gestures too, okay? So this is not, this is not an interrogation in the police station. You can use your hands to emphasize gestures, but again, do not be throwing them up, out, up about haphazardly, okay? There, there is, there is moderation in everything that has to be um, recognized. So please use hand gestures because they also help to emphasize points, but use them sparingly. In all, you'd have to build your communication skills. These are essential for successful interviews. You might have all the right answers, just like Benny has helped to find the answers to some of the critical questions but then how you articulate these things are crucial. First, you need to start by actively listening to the interviewer. You are there to answer questions, but the first part is that you've got to listen attentively. Because if you do not get the answers right, you are going to deviate. You might be answering in ways that is not expected and you are doing yourself more disservice than good. So listen attentively, guys. This will mean that you focus on what they are saying and then you can ask clarifying questions, okay? It is not wrong to ask clarifying questions because the interviewers themselves might not be the best communicators. So they might be asking some of these questions in ways that are not the best, but they are expecting you to be answering what they expect. So for you to answer right, you can always ask, Okay, um, um, may I ask, by you asking me this, does it mean this and that and that for them to say yes or for them to clarify it? It is not wrong for you to ask these questions. It's better to rephrase and get the question right in the right context than to rush into answering and then deviating. And remember to respond thoughtfully, okay? <coughs> Sorry about that. So with this in mind, you still need to practice your speaking skills. Remember using your friends and, and relatives, do practice your speaking skills very much. Speak clearly and concisely and avoid using filler words like, um, and like, and um, guys, we all fall trapped to that. That is why you need to pay attention. These things would reduce the, the way you are seen as confident, okay? And remember, pauses are critical to every speech, okay? You can use pauses in a powerful way. So do not feel that you are under pressure to keep talking consistently like a machine gun. So when you need to grab thoughts, instead of using the filler words where you are grappling for the thoughts and saying, um, I think, you know what, if I go to, um, some years back when I was doing all these things, um, avoid the M's. You can use good pauses and it's fine, okay? It allows or it gives the vibe of you being confident. Again, I would want to touch on the point that ask questions, okay? But ask relevant questions, clarifying questions so that you can know what is going on in the minds of these interviewers. Okay, you, you do not want to go ask for the answers or you do not want to be probing private stuff. 
ask questions pertaining to the interview so that you can get clearer understanding. But guys, even with good preparation and a positive mindset, you may still experience these anxieties during the interview. So here are some of the coping strategies that may help you if you apply them. One thing is to take deep breaths to calm yourself. This works not only in interviews. The more rapid you take breaths, the more tense and anxious you become. And I'm not saying just take one deep breath and then continue with short, fast breaths. In all your speech, take deep breaths and that would help you remain calm. That is also going to help you to come out with lots of words before you take in the next breath. The other point, like I already mentioned, is use positive self-talk to remind yourself that you are prepared and capable. You've made it to the interview. Therefore, the panel believes that you could fill the role. So have that positive self-talk. Speak to yourself. Even if you have to stand be before the mirror and speak positively to yourself, go ahead and do it. It might sound cheesy. It might sound cliche, but it works. So if it works, try it out. Remember that you need to visualize a calming image or scenario to help you relax. So this scenario is, is different with everyone. With someone, it's is the giggles of a baby. The other is the, the rush of the sea waves. Others is a calming sunset in the winds. Visualize these things constantly before the interview. It helps to calm you down. The calmer you are, the more confident you'll be during the interview. So you've armed yourself with the answers like Benny brought in but you need to calm yourself down. You do not go, want to go in there fidgeting and nervous. In that way, whatever it is you say, it would be going through the filter of a nervous person. And that would not score you good marks in your interview. And if you encounter an unexpected question, so you've prepared so much, you've prepared with all the possible things, and then you get an uppercut question where you've not prepared for this thing. What do you think you're going to do? Guys, you need to take a moment to collect your thoughts. It is not a crime to pause to collect your thoughts. I would want to repeat, you are not supposed to be a machine gun there where you need to be firing at will. Take your time. It doesn't mean you need to sit and take forever where you look like you're clueless. But then a few seconds of pause helps. No one is going to penalize you for that. Gather your thoughts and then come out with the best response you could. That calmness during that period would do you a big service, even if you do not know the right answer, than rushing and fidgeting and saying whatever it is. You, you would look immature and ill-prepared. Okay. So these are a few tricks that are going to help you build your confidence and overcome your fears when it comes to interviews. And guess what? Another thing that many people overlook, which is well after the interview, is that you can craft a good thank you note and send to the in, uh, inviter, the one who invited you or the panel. And during this period, you, are, you want to keep it really brief and short, but then if there were some questions that you, you kind of answered in a bit of an unsatisfactory way, you could use this thank you note to kind of clarify it. You don't want to write a whole essay, but you could want to realign or readjust that perception, okay? It's a last ditch effort to kind of um, cross the T's and dot the I's in there. It is not a whole explanation, but it kind of salvages some of the points you think you might have uh, miscommunicated out. Remember, you want to keep it brief, extremely brief, because after the interview, all these panel guys are going to be very busy marking the ton of people who came through the interview. And this should be a last ditch effort when the interview is over. But the points that was raised earlier on, 
is that you should remember to prepare well, to have a positive mindset, to, to fight the negative thoughts in your head. Practice, practice, practice. And with all these things, you would increase your chances of answering these questions in a more confident way and your fears of interviews would drastically reduce. So I hope these points are, is, this, these points are going to help you guys to, to do the best in your interviews as they come your way. Thanks, guys. It's, it's been exciting having me here. So I give it over to Wilfred. Hi, Wilfred. Um, I think Gideon has muted. Wolfred. Yes, I'm muting Wilfred. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Right, Wilfred, go ahead. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Seth. And that has also been an, another amazing presentation from, from you. Let me just remind um, us that this is an international platform, and I would explain why. We have participants from Nigeria and Sierra Leone joining us, apart from um, the various universities from, from Ghana. We have uh, other partners in Nigeria and Sierra Leone. So I want to acknowledge uh, their participation, especially from Sierra Leone. We have uh, James Samadu, Mohamed Ba, Julius Sama, and Suleiman Mbama. And then from Nigeria, we also want to acknowledge the presence of Julius Emeka James Kani, Odagbe Miss Cecilia, uh, Sandy Stephen and Mary Adiba, all from Nigeria. Um, we also have students from the University of Science and Technology, University of Ghana, UCC, University of Mines and Technology, and of course, the Mother Mining Institution, Imperial College of Mines and Safety. Um, we have several questions in the chat area. And I will quickly uh, move to one of the questions. So this question is on the automated tracking system, the ATS. And the question is from Kwame. Uh, Kwame is asking that in the case of a fresh graduate whose best experience is just a one-time opportunity to intern, but has the quest to learn, how is such a person able to cross over with an experienced person for the same position using the ATS screening stage? at the experienced person having more of his key work. So Benny, I, I think this question is to you, comparing an intern or a fresh graduate to a, uh, an experienced person using the ATS, where keywords are involved. What are the chances of this fresh graduate uh, getting employed? Hello, Benny. Wow. I think I've muted Benny. Right, Benny, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you muted. Anyway, um, thank you, Alfred. Uh, I mean, obviously, this is a straightforward answer. You are a fresh graduate uh, with limited experience. In the first place, if you are looking for a job opportunity, and you're applying for roles. Remember that for every role advert or job advert, there are certain requirements that you have to meet. And the fact that you draft your CV and apply for the role does not mean you will get a slot, even if you should put in all the key elements. You must ensure that the basic competencies in terms of the requirements are met with regards to the qualifications, the key experiences they are looking out for, and even the number of experience that they are also looking out for. So it's important if you are you are vying for a position with an experienced candidate, unless it's an entry level role that does not require all of that, then you should obviously not even waste your time. If they are requesting for a five years experience and you know you do not have that, if they are looking for specific skills, you do not possess that, you don't go ahead to even apply for it and go and fast and pray that. It works out for you. Yeah, Wilfred. 
Wilfred. Wilfred, you can unmute yourself. Thank you very much, um, Benny. Enoch has a rather interesting question, and Enoch is asking whether it is always the case in selecting a candidate. He is talking about uh, protocol and what you can say about that. Whether uh, protocols also go through the same selection process or they are just appointed for the sake of it. Um, thank you, Enoch, for this question. Um, when it comes to protocols, I mean, you, you are speaking about people that probably have been recommended uh, based on the affiliations with other people. I would like you to know that in terms of the general process, every, every recruitment process is supposed to be formalized and you have to go through the process. I can speak with what we do, which I know more and more official irrespective of the protocol nature of your recommendation, you would have to first of all fit into the rule. So yes, you've been recommended. We would want to pay attention to your CV because obviously there are over a thousand CVs. We cannot review all the 2,000, 3,000 applicant CVs that we receive. And for that reason, we would review to some extent. If we get a number of suitable candidates that we think we could interview, we would leave the rest and move on. If it happens that you are a protocol, by virtue of you being a protocol, your CV would get that reference and would be reviewed. However, it has to meet the requirements of the rule. Um, for an institution, uh, a global institution, or let me say a multinational institution where policies and procedures are taken with keen interest, you must understand that your protocol will bring your CV up for review but then must meet all the requirements of the rule before you be considered for the rule. Uh, I hope this answers your question. Thank you very much, Benny. Let me also state that the, the entire interview process or the selection process is also audited by an independent body. So if you are not following the procedure, then you would have compliance issue as the hiring manager. So whether you are protocol or not, you, you need to go through the, the system to prove your worth. Thank you very much, uh, Benny. There is, there is another question and the question is from Eugene. Eugene is asking uh, where you go, go for an interview and then the panel deliberately uh, frustrate and make jokes just to frustrate you. Uh, he's asking whether it's a good practice on the side of the panel. Yeah, um, Eugene, thanks for the question. Um, truthfully, every interview and the type of questions that will be set, and it depends on the rule. There are certain rules that would, re, uh, would include you being tested on how quick tempered you are, how you are able to handle pressure and all that. So sometimes some of the reactions to your responses by the panel is just to see how you would handle some of these things. If you are put on the spot, if, if you have someone coming to you in that manner, how are you going to manage it? And there are several types of interviews. I mean, if we have time, if it happens that this session comes up again within the year, I don't know when, I don't know if it's even going to happen. We'll talk about even the structure of interviews, the type of interviews. I've mentioned that we have the behavior, we have, we have the formal and the informal type of interviews where the unstructured interviews, the questions are not set for you to even know that it's following a specific order. And this type, everybody is giving you questions here and there and you're supposed to respond. So it depends on the type of interview, it depends on the role itself and what the expectations are. If the expectation involves uh, instances where you are going to be working under pressure and even will include your patients being tested, they can come up with questions or frame questions that could just test that ability for you to control yourself in such a manner. Go for it. Okay, so if I would want, this is said, if I would want to add to what um, Benny said, um, it depends again, like he said, on um, the industry or the role. 
So if you might be at a um, help desk or call center for say a network provider, where people could call with sour mouths, your response is critical to the company's success. So the best thing is to test you in that context to see whether you are going to have patience enough or not. Or if you might be work, working in an elderly home where the patients themselves are going to be in, in, in quotes abusive to you in, in words, then such tests during this period is appropriate. But if it has nothing to do and they're just jeering at you, just trying to frustrate you, then it calls to mind if it is um, ethical or not. For example, if you are in a you are interviewing for a role in um as an accountant in a mining company and you are being heckled this way, then it could raise questions. So the context plays a huge role in this. Thanks. All right. Uh, thanks, Charles. Uh, this question is coming from uh, Kwekumbra. I don't know whether uh, that's my brother or another person bearing that name. Uh, the, his question is, uh, what is the best way to go around job recruitment process that entails assignments? Okay, so if I get a question right, the recruitment pro process involves setting tax. And so you go through a series of um assignments before you actually get the opportunity to to meet the panel um charles if if you are on the call can you throw more light on your question okay so uh wilfred uh, i hope you can hear me so most of the times uh, with multinationals and uh, once you are seeded through the first stage you are given assignments to take like to complete and uh what I've realized is that most of these young graduates do not take their time to complete uh, these assignments. They just rush through it. And so uh, I would want uh, Benny or Seth and yourself to throw more light on how young graduates should tackle such assignments because uh, they are also part of the interview process and they can make or make your selection. That's what I wanted more light to be thrown on. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Charles, for the clarity. Uh, so, Benny, so take a typical process like graduate training, where you are given serious um, series of tax or assignment, and and run us through whilst trying to answer uh, Charles's question. Um, I, I was first coming to say Charles actually answered the question in his response, but anyway. He made mention that it forms part of the recruitment process. Yes, uh, we have several ways that we use in our selection. Actually, this forms part of the selection stage of the recruitment process. This can happen as an interview process. It can, it can happen as a pre-interview uh, process, a selection process before the interview. So more of a pre-screening before the shortlisting. And in truth, if most of these questions are supposed to be situational, and some of them will be behavioral. Uh, situational because we want to, first of all, test your thinking ability and being able to put to paper how your thoughts flow in your head. So if you are responding to such a question, obviously you would want to use the STAR process or the STAR method. And you have to have a good understanding of the subject matter that you are discussing in terms of what the question is hovering around. If you have a better understanding of the question, then you be able to do this. Well, for graduate trainees, yes, it's easy for us to use the situation, situational type of questions to assess their thinking ability and the understanding of the rule and even the industry they want to fit into. So basically, yes, you answer the question. It forms part of the recruitment process. You don't just write anything and assume that it is just a test, so it's not nothing. It is. It could actually be. A whole interview in itself. We've had instances where we didn't do the oral type of interviews. Um, we actually had um, an interview assessment where the the able we we set questions and they sit behind the computers to respond to them just like they do in their exam rooms. So yes, it forms part of the interview. You take all seriousness and respond to the question, understand it, and make sure you use the start process in responding to that. Thanks, uh, thanks, Benny. 
Uh, and of course, we can't be having questions on interviewing without the question of salary coming in. So Seth is asking, is asking us to throw more light on questions regarding salary expectation, the, the pros and cons of uh, bidding higher than what a company can afford and all of that. And then his second question is about leaving your previous job why did you leave your previous job and uh, why do you want to work with this current institution? So let me give the salary question to Benny and then uh, the second question to set to, to, to answer. So Benny, over to you. I wish you would make me answer the second one, but- Okay, so, so, so you, let's, let's, let's swap it. Answer the second question. You want me to go ahead with the second question? Yes, answer the second second uh, set to answer the first. All right. Um, the reason I wanted to answer the second question is because it's something that uh, forms part of the some of the common interview questions that you could you could easily meet at any interview, especially if you are changing companies. And also one of the reasons why I wanted to answer this question is just to draw a highlight on the fact that I've sat in interviews had people respond to these questions, trying to backmark their previous employers or current employers. Um, I always feel when you give that impression, you actually create an impression on the minds of the current employer that this is the same thing you would do to him or her if you get the opportunity to move to another company. So in as much as you wish to change companies, Always keep in mind that when responding to such a question, you must not but math your current employer. However, speak about the things that you've learned over there. Talk about what aroused your interest to want to be with the new company. And then some of the things that you can even take from your previous employer and bring on board to the new company that you think will be beneficial based on what you've learned from the job description. It is always important to put value on the current employer's contribution to your career development and then exhibit how you're going to translate that into the new companies, I mean, job culture and job success. And once you're able to put these two together, the current employer will have faith in you that, look, you just don't join companies, but then you learn from them and even willing to use it to contribute to their quota. Yeah, so that is also from there. When we get a chance to talk more about this if we have the chance again i'm sure we'll be we'll be discussing all of these into details with specific examples thank you very much uh, benny so um about a month ago about a month ago i had a cousin resigning from a very known company um, and his reason for for resigning was actually that he stood up to the owner of the business the owner of the business was trying to sack a lady and then he mentioned that the, the lady did not did not commit the error that uh, she was being accused of so because he stood up to the owner of the business the owner of the business decided that okay then uh, he should leave and then he left so for such an individual who left a business with this experience when he goes into another interview and he's asked why he left his previous role, should he tell the panel what I have just narrated or he should uh, play the ostrich and pretend like that not, nothing happened and he was just trying to advance his experience? I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, so Wilfred, you see, the point I'm making is bad mathing the company, not lying. Um, if that is what happened, that is what led to your separation. So you have to say that exactly, because that is what's led to your exiting of the company. However, instances where people are asked why they want to leave their current employer or why, why did they leave their previous employer? And then they try to give picture and negative image about the organization. Meanwhile, you've worked with this organization for the past seven years. You've worked with this organization for the past 20 years. You feel it's like being in a marriage and then being in it for 10 years. There is an instance where something goes wrong and then that thing depicts the entire 10 years that you've been in the marriage. It becomes like that is the only thing that happens in the marriage. There are good things that happen and the negative things. Yes, this is what led to your separation. However, you also highlight the fact that even though this is what led to the separation, 
if it wasn't for this, you didn't even have the mindset to leave because of these good stuff that you had over there going for you. So it is important you blend that. I mean, in this in itself is not bad math and it's just being truthful. And in all interviews, the basic principle is you have to be truthful in your submission. You don't want to lie because even if you are found to be lying, that is even a question on integrity. And for that reason, you might even lose the chance to even be selected for the role. All right. Uh, Seth, your question had to do with salary and bidding higher what, than what the company can afford. Uh, what will be your mm. response? Okay, so this is this is quite a tricky one. Um, what are the reasons why you're bidding higher than what the company can afford? Is it is it you trying to rip the company off, or is it that um, your worth or the skill set you're bringing is is too sought after? Um, mind you, every company, every well structured company has their own um, salary bands for whichever role they are advertising. However, they need to know the candidate's own expectations because it helps play into the processes so that they can tell if they are meeting the candidate's choices or if their negotiation skills are good enough to save the company money. Now, you know your worth. Okay, so no one is going to dictate what salary you are looking for. And you know, you know what situation you're in, how desperate you are to find the role or get in. So much of the choice is with you. For example, you might be in a company that is paying you um, X amount of dollars. Let me say, say $5,000 per month. And this role has come up. You're interested in it. You give out your your quotes as 5000 or more or maybe 6000 and the company isn't isn't there yet the company might be ready to um offer say 4000 cities if you are the ideal candidate the the panel will not write you off just because of your salary expectations they would want to reach out to you and negotiate at the point of negotiation it is all up to you in that case, I cannot advise you because you know what situation you're in. If it is that you're looking at a bigger picture where you want to get in at that salary and grow through the ranks, or if you are going to turn that down. Okay, so I don't know if that answers your question. However, you should research, if you are a new person in that role, you should research the average salary of that role so that when you are asked, you can put in the, the right, the right um, amount. But I don't think just bidding a high amount, if you did score well on the interview would disqualify you. So I'm still trying to wrap my mind around what pros and cons um, you are expecting to get with a high bid. I don't know if that answers it or probably you should clarify the question it, much. Yeah. It really does. It's unfortunately my network was unstable, and so I I went off a bit during the time the explanation to um you, whether you should be candid with yourself, especially reasons for which you left your previous job. You have to be frank with your panel, tell them the truth and all that. That was when I left. But joining in, I think the explanation <laughs> to the um, the first question is, is is really clear, and because normally we do encounter questions like that, and you know when you ask people, they tell you to give a range, and in my case, it has not helped me to a reasonable extent. There was a time I think my recent job when I went there, I gave a range, and later on, when they employed me, they called me all right, but then the money they gave me was even not within the range I gave. You know, it was way below that. And the trick most of the employers are using this time is they will not give you um, the appointment letter because the appointment letter should have how much they have agreed to pay you on it. And sometimes even if you force them to give you the appointment letter, they will not introduce or include the amount they are paying you until the first month when they know very well that you cannot leave. So all these right. things are problems. If indeed you can... <laughs> Throw some that's, light that's on that. Strange... Have to when you find yourself within Sorry. that circle. 
Yeah. No, please go ahead. Sorry, I thought you were done. Yeah. Like, yeah, please. In case you, you find yourself within that circle where the employer refused to tell okay. you how much are you done they are going the to pay you. Dropped? And they find ways and means. <laughs> Hello? Hello, Check. please. I'm, uh, Check. Am I okay. Hi. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, right. As I was saying, I had a, the same problem and I believe it might happen to a brother on this uh, meeting. Maybe you, you, you are employed. All right. But then the amount you even stated, you, you were expecting that within the range, something of that sort should happen. And then they employ you, they refuse to give you an appointment letter and maybe uh, being persistent, you went out there and then later on, they gave you the appointment letter, but it didn't capture how much the company had agreed to pay you. And maybe so, you work uh, for the first uh, month. Harry, then. Harry. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, we we understand your question. Let me just say that it is, okay. it is unethical. It's not a professional HR practice for offers to be, be made without uh, okay. stating how much is being paid out. Then what are you accepting to? Because such offers, you are supposed to uh, give uh, an acceptance. So what do you accept if uh, salaries are not mentioned okay. or benefits are not mentioned? What do you accept? Okay. Wilfred, um, to throw more light on this and let's um, set understand wow. the essence of this. Um, Section 12 of the Labor Act requires a written contract okay. of employment okay. for work done for a period of six months or for a number of working days equivalent to six months within a year. And the contract is expected to express in clear terms the rights and duties of the parties, which includes stating the salary. So if you are joining a company who does not give you um, an, a contract of employment okay. for the work you're going to provide, the service you're going to provide to them, you should first of all know that there is no contract. Because if you've not signed to these things, then where is the agreement? Obviously, uh, people are being taken advantage of because okay. of the unemployment situation in the country. Mm -hmm. But it's important that you know your rights and then seek for these things. When you exactly. demand for them and they know exactly. you need it, obviously they will be they will okay. be upright in their in the, in the discharge of their duties as well. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well said. I wanted to, um, um, Wilfred, I wanted to make a comment on the salary uh, negotiation or okay. expected salary. Okay. As, okay. As, okay. As, okay. Yes, um, adding to what Seth mentioned, it is always important that as uh, an applicant or an interviewee, you research the industry salary range for the role that you are applying for. And remember, Seth mentioned that there are salary ranges. For every role, there is a band, and the band is based on the categorization of the role, which some, some companies call grade, others call um, pay skills. It is important that you know, if you're an HR in the mining industry, your pay skill or salary band for the HR officer will actually be different from an HR officer within the financial institutions or the banking industry. It is therefore important that you know that if you know that of the banking industry, it does not relate to that of the mining industry. And for that reason, you have to research, you have to have an idea. So you can do this by asking around, calling even um, people within the same industry or within the same company that you are aware of working with the company to give you just an indication of what the range is. This prepares you and gives you uh, greater power in your negotiation. It is also important, you mentioned that the range, if an organization gives you a salary which is below the range you stated, it doesn't necessarily mean that you've been cheated. You should take that in mind because they have a salary band. For all you know, the maximum of that salary band is $2,000. You have gone to mention a salary band or a range of $4,000 to $6,000. The organization has budgeted for this rule and the maximum they can offer for that rule is $2,000. The fact that you mentioned $4,000 to $6,000 does not mean the organization will come to you with $4,000. The organization will come to you to negotiate and try to negotiate within their salary band, which is $1,000 to $2,000, and at most give you the $2,000, which is the highest. So it is important we understand how this process works to be able to, or to uh, have a better understanding of the offers that we receive from the organizations. Okay. 
<clears throat> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And and to to top up with what Benny and and Wilfred also said, if you are dealing with an ethical company, they would let you know what salary they are going to settle on and even give you the appointment letter before you commence. So if what they are putting on the table is below your, your stated amount, and it is a no-no no for you. Sorry? And if it is a no-no for you, it is just up to you to reject that, um, that offer. So it's not in a way cheating you in any ways. You have, you have been pre-informed of what amount is going to come to you before you sign. But in your in your situation where it's weird, where you have to start before you sign, that's that's a whole different thing. So, just as Benny did say, all right, you all should right. know, yeah. So, um, all right. thank, thank you very much. There, there is a question from Esther on how to address anxiety in the interview room. I know you you mentioned that uh, in thirty seconds. Can you do a recap for Esther? Okay, so Esther, the anxiety in the interview room, one, you've got to put it in your mind that it is a natural thing. Anything you're taking seriously would come along with some amount of anxiety. Your aim is to fight it as much as you can, but you cannot start fighting it in the interview room. Step one is you need to prepare very well. The more prepared you are, the less anxious you are going to get in the interview room. Even with the interview, even with the preparation, if it has gone on well, once you're in the room, you've got to think of the wins that has brought you in the room, okay? That you, you've gone through the weeds of everyone's application to be in there. So that is a win. And that should help you know that every member of that candidate, or sorry, of that panel, have in their minds that you could fill up the role. Those positive thoughts should help reduce this anxiety, okay? And then remember your body posture plays a huge part. You might think the anxiety is coming from your head, but your body posture, your relaxed nature, the smile you give out, all play roles in reducing this anxiety. However, if you go in there ill-prepared, if you go in there doubting yourself, if you go in there when you truly know that you are not qualified to be there, for example, you know the minimum requirements doesn't meet you, but it is someone who snuck you in, then that guilty thought is a legit thought that's going to keep you anxious. But if you did go through the right process, you submitted with with no favors given to you, and you did prepare well, have it in your mind that this thing could be you, okay? This, this job could be yours, and that you are not the only one who's been that nervous, but you've got to relax. And typically, if you are relaxed with the first two answers, it is natural that you would, you would calm down with the rest. Okay, but it is not in the interview room that you can really nail this thing. It starts way before the interview date, all right? And again, remember your breathe in, breathe out process. Take deep breaths, all right? You need to have deep breaths, relax your shoulders, and, and believe that it's not the end of the world, all right? probably at that crucial moment, those are the things that could help you. But for the third time, it starts before the interview. So prepare well, prepare well, prepare well. I hope it does answer some amount though. Mm. Thank you very much, Seth. And mm -hmm. there is a question from Mami Pokia. I don't know if she's still on the call, but her question now has to do with um being on in an interview and you being discouraged from your passion uh, by the panel. I <laughs> hello, mommy. Are you are you on the call? Can you throw more light on your question for 
the distinguished guest to answer. Uh, Benny and said, if any of you understands her question, uh, you you can you can I answer. Can open the question in the chat, please. Well, so the question is, how do you handle a situation where the interviewer is discouraging you from your passion during the interview section? Um, okay, okay. Let me take it then. <laughs> anyway, I mean that would that would only happen if probably the passion you are exhibiting or whatever you are saying in relation to your passion has nothing really to do with the role. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out a situation where an interview panel would want to discourage you from your passion. I would only do that if it has nothing to do with the role. If your passion is to run a 100 meter race and we are interviewing you for an HR officer and you are talking about a 100 meter race and I feel it's irrelevant to the discussions we are having. And for that reason, I want to draw your attention to the fact that um, this really has nothing to do with what we are discussing. And for that matter, uh, stick to the subjects of discussion. Uh, I wouldn't call that a discouragement. I would rather say drawing attention to the fact that you need to stick to the area of discussion. Um, if she was around, she could give us a better insight into what she, she meant by discouraged passion. But uh, that is how mm, I, I understand it. So, I, I, I see, uh, uh, Mami Pokia, can you throw more light on your question? <coughs> Hello, uh, Benny. Hey, sorry, Wolfred. Hi, Gideon. Right. So, just a quick one to what Benny said. And indeed, that, that is the, a very good response. You see, we should all understand that when it comes to interviews and um, job performance, passion is a crucial element. So in an interview, when you are asked to talk about your passion, make sure that whatever passion you state fits into your ability to perform in the role that you are being interviewed for. Don't go, make the mistake to go and talk about um, something irrelevant. Make sure the passion aligns with the specific role you are being interviewed for. The reason is this. Once you say, I mean, you state a passion that is relevant, they know that when you are engaged, you perform um, without struggle. So it is important to uh, state a very good uh, passion in alignment with the role you are, you are applying for. What the panel actually did was to realign the panel is not discouraging whoever it is. The panel is even trying to help you respond to the questions properly. So um, the panel didn't discourage you at all from your passion. They were rather giving you a clue so that you come back and then you restate um, a good passion. Thank you. So go ahead. All right. Uh, thank you, Gideon. The link, the link to the first. Um, conversation that we had on the 2nd of April is, is still in the chat area. So for those of you asking questions on CV preparation and all of that, go click on the link and, and listen to, uh, to to it. That would answer all your questions. Uh, Esther, thank you very much. Uh, and Ajay wants to know the extent to which your medical can affect your qualification. Uh, the extent to which medicals can affect qualification. Uh, any of you? Uh, Seth, can you answer this for us? Yeah, sure, I can. So every job role has its own requirements, both mentally and physically, okay? So one thing is to be sure that you are physically fit for the work because there's a lot of liabilities that come with people not being fit for work safety concerns, um, financial concerns for the company. But let's put all those ones aside and see how best you can perform you in your role if you have some physical defects. For example, you are applying for a call center and you have hearing issues that you realize that might not be the best fit. Or you want to work in a highly physical area in the mind, say a plant operator, but you, you are susceptible to, to stress, physical stress, right? That 
could affect your qualification. That's one thing. The other areas where medicals are required is for liability sake, where you are coming in with a certain kind of ailment or medical defect. The company needs to see. It might not affect your qualification, but on your exit medicals, if you are going to make claims that I had this medical issue because of my engagement with this company, your, your pre-employment medicals would help the company avoid some mitigations or could help you, the candidates yourself, to, to clearly prove that I didn't have this condition before I came in, the working condition caused this, and to help you to get this compensation. But I think that is a different topic to talk about. But with your qualification, if your job role requires a certain physical or medical um, status, and the medicals that you take reveal this, then you should understand that it, it is for the safety of the company and for yourself to not be allowed to take on that role. So there are peculiar cases where it could affect. Thank I you very that much. Yes, yeah. I am. Thanks, Seth. Uh, right. Students from the University of Development Studies, you are also acknowledged. I just had a message that if I don't acknowledge you, you do a luta. So I'm acknowledging students from UDS okay. as well. Um, we'll close at nine o'clock. We have seven minutes now to run up the discussion. Um, Benny, what will be your, your last words on, on this discussion? Oh, I think um, Seth rightly answered it. Um, he, he covered all, all the points. I like the fact that he ended on the legalities and the liabilities to the organization and also in terms of the candidates knowing the exact medical I mean, situation before the, he was um, onboarded and at the exit point knows how the extent to which it has either distorted or what it was before he joined. So I think Seth actually responded to it very well. All right. Uh, thank you, Benny. So in, in rounding up the conversation on interview skills and CV preparation, uh, top of mind, you being the resource person and a practitioner, uh, what should we take away? Okay. I think the same statements have been repeated in our first session and the second session. It is always important to prepare ahead of time. And in your preparation, always make sure that you review the job adverse to understand the requirements in terms of the uh, key elements within the job description and the person specifications. Once you have these, they become your weapon to attack. When I say weapon to attack, remember that when you come to an interview, it's like you're going proceeding on a wall. You are meeting someone, you need to be able to convince the person to make the right decision and select <laughs> the room. Uh, so if you are making that decision, make sure that you review what they are requiring, what they are looking out for, which is all stated in the role description match your skills to these rules, make sure this reflects in your CV, and make sure this also re reflects in your responses to their questions. In as much as you want to come up strong by giving them what they want to hear, don't be lying at the interview. If you know you do not know how to perform a particular task, the fact that you saw it in the job adverse does not mean you should speak about it when you know nothing about it. But other than that, if they are able to sense that you do not know much or they begin to ask you follow-up questions on the specific responses you are giving, you might find yourself wanting and destroying your confidence at the interview. So it is important that you pay attention to the job description and identify the key elements from the description and the person specification. Set questions around these key elements. Find suitable questions, uh, responses to these um, questions that you've set. We get good responses from the internet. However, it's always good that you tailor these responses that you found on the internet to suit what you have and what you do. And then you speak to it, practice it as Seth mentioned. You can use a coach or you can even use your own mirror as you're practicing too. Once you've been able to come up with all of this, you'll be ready for the interview. And when you meet any of these questions at the interview, you flow with no distractions. All right, so thank, thank, thank you. Be my yeah. Thank you, Benny. Uh, set your, your last comment. Okay, thanks, Benny. The last thing I'm going to add is that 
it's it's always a journey of learning okay no one is perfect on the first day obama couldn't speak like he could on day one so the point is that we've got to practice 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 i think benny has already touched on that if you have the chance um apply as much as you can get into interviews even if you do not hit the job you could learn a lot from the panel from the feedback they give you and then you can better yourself so try as much as possible to practice 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 all these points you don't have to wait till the interview invitation has come practice these points that we've discussed and by the time it hits or it comes to you you would have improved dramatically and um, you would find it to be easier than you expect it to be so that's my last take let's keep practicing and let's keep growing thanks, thanks very Wolf. much thanks right. thanks Seth. and um so we are most grateful and we thank all of you it's been uh very interesting for the past two hours we've all learned various uh, techniques and skills on CV preparation and uh, interview skills and all of that. We are most grateful to our two resource persons, Benny Smith and then Seth Adigi. They've been very helpful. And judging from the comments that have come, uh, these two sections have really been uh, very very informative and educative, especially for uh, our graduates or would be graduates from UDS, UCC, University of Ghana, uh, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, uh, Imperial College of Mines and Safety, and our neighboring partners from Nigeria and Sierra Leone. Uh, we are grateful and. The platform, once again, is the empowerment series, and you should be on the lookout for the next uh, seminar that the platform would, would grant us. At this stage, uh, we want to show our appreciation to the, the convener of, of this platform, uh, Neo Kwesi Akwa. He's been very magnanimous and given us the opportunity to have this discussion if you were all here on the first day you realize that we had a limited capacity and quickly he had to uh, go back and then change uh, his package to ensure that we can accommodate a larger number and to this we, we are most grateful and we look forward to more exciting seminars from him i want to hand over to him now for him to close the session all right, so thank you very much, uh, Wilfred. Uh, currently, I'm projecting the next session, which would actually happen, um, I mean, next week on professional branding and positioning. Again, it fits into um, your preparation towards winning a job. So um, the two people who will be handling this will be Kwame Asiwomi, um, Azonu, and then Seth Adeje. Right, so uh, please take note. Going forward, we'll be sharing the link and all other relevant information on this, on the various platforms. So, Wilfred, um, take over. Hello, Wilfred. Hi, Gideon. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so go to the YouTube, the TES YouTube page and then subscribe you would have all of these uh, recordings on there and then listen listen to it if you have any question the whatsapp platforms are available our resource persons are on send in your questions again and then they would answer thank you very much and let's all have a very good weekend bye bye Bye.